Hi, my name is Danielle Cross. I'm the Stroke Medical Director at Lancaster General Hospital. Uh, and today I'm here to talk about uh, neuroanatomy exam and cases. Uh, thanks for joining. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about anatomy. We won't get too in the weeds, but there's a few things I want you to take away from this. And so first, with a little bit of basic anatomy, one image I really love is the homunculus here that you can see on the left side. And basically what this does is show you in this representation which parts of the body are represented by which parts of the brain. And the only thing I want you to take away from this is that the hand and the face take up a huge part of the brain and that the legs and torso are kind of relegated to this very thin slice at the top of the brain. Looking over at the right side of the screen, we could see the whole outline of the brain looking from the outside or if we sliced it right in the middle. And what I want you to take away from this is that the front of the brain identified with the blue and the red colors here take up a huge portion of the brain, but the yellow and green representing the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe also take up a large part of the back and underside of the brain. We're going to go through some scoring systems that are commonly used pre-hospital by EMS services and you'll see that a large portion of those scoring systems look at the front of the brain and really ignore the back and bottom of the brain, which still take up a lot of space inside the head. So for a few simple localization tools, what we can look at is which lobes of the brain do which things, largely speaking. So we could say that the front of the brain is primarily responsible for speech when it's usually the left side of the brain, but in about 10 to 15 percent of people, the right side of the brain does speech. And the front of the brain is also responsible for motor function, so controlling the movement and strength in arms and legs. The parietal lobe, which was that back part of the brain, is largely responsible for sensation, and the left side of the brain controls sensation on the right, and the right side of the brain controls sensation on the left. The very back of the brain, the occipital lobe, is largely responsible for vision, which can be really important, and we're going to talk about that. It's an underrated part of the scoring systems, uh, and it's important to understand how that works. And the cerebellum, which wasn't highlighted in any of those colors, but is a really important part of the brain, is largely responsible for our coordination and balance, being able to walk normally without assistance, um, and oftentimes um, can lead to feelings of dizziness uh, when it is disturbed. So we'll keep that in mind and come back to it. So on this slide, what, we've, what we're looking at is those different parts of the brain that are color-coded by the blood vessel that supplies them. And so it is similar to the anatomical divisions of the brain, but it's not exactly the same. And so what I want to highlight here is that, again, we said those scoring systems that we're going to go over largely focus on the front of the brain. Specifically, they focused on what we call anterior circulation or the blood vessels that supply the front. And so that covers the ACA territory and the MCA territory in blue and yellow here. Now, that's a huge part of the brain, but I think it's important to take away that there's still a lot here in this green and this red area that are not covered by the blue and yellow. And so these areas of the brain can be really ignored by some of the scoring systems. And our goal when we leave here, I think is really to take away that there's a big part of the brain that's not necessarily always covered in some of our pre-hospital assessments. So if we know that, we can keep it in mind and not miss those strokes. This is just another slice of the brain. So this is looking at it from the front. If you were looking at the person straight on and if you were talking to them, and this is as if they were laying on a table, and this is the back of the brain, and this is the front. And it's just another way to show that those 
blue and yellow areas, the part of the brain supplied by the anterior circulation is a huge part of the brain. So it makes sense that those scoring systems use these areas of the brain to identify strokes. There's a good chance that that part of the brain is going to be injured because it takes up so much of the brain if you had a clot go randomly anywhere in the brain. But there's still a large portion in red and green that is not being covered in a lot of those scoring systems. Okay, so I also just wanted to show this view, which is the underside of the brain. It's a really nice view of two things. First, it shows you some of the blood vessels as they go and approach the brain, and it also shows you the locations of common aneurysm. So what I want you to take away from this is that this is the cerebellum back here, the underside and bottom of the brain. This is the temporal lobe, which kind of stuck out to the side. And then this is the frontal lobe because we're looking at everything from the bottom. And what you can see is that in the back of the brain, you have this major blood vessel system, the vertebral arteries and the basilar artery, which course along the bottom of the brain. And there are several locations where it's common to develop aneurysms. The front of the brain is supplied by these blood vessels here. These are the MCA, which we talked about, and ACA branches. And you can see these little depictions of aneurysms here as to the common locations where they can occur. So based on everything we just talked about, it's important to understand what the symptoms would be from these anterior circulation blood vessels because when we think about ischemic strokes or strokes that come from clots, these blood vessels are going to be a large percentage of the blood vessels that are affected in, in all comers, but it's still a lot of territory and a lot of the important blood vessels that are not really being captured there. So this posterior circulation system is really vulnerable to both aneurysms and also to strokes. Okay, so now I want to get a little bit into the neurologic exam, which so many of you are so excellent at performing. Uh, and what we want to do is highlight a few major things to take away. And again, I'm going to focus on what is covered in some of the scoring systems, but also what is not really covered in the scoring system that you can still easily do on your exam coming in. So before you start taking an exam, the most important thing to understand is what is the baseline state of someone that you're being called to evaluate? And so that way you have something to compare to. So we're going to talk about what's normal, but a totally normal exam may not be normal for every individual person. So understanding what they started as and when it changed are the most important things to understand before you get started. And then your general neurologic exam, what you see us do when you roll in with the patient, covers these basic tenets, except we oftentimes don't do reflexes there in front of you. It's often not relevant for an immediate stroke evaluation. So we're not going to talk about that today, but it is important for a um, total complete neurologic exam. So let's get into each of these things. Mental status is actually quite easy to assess. When you show up at the scene and is the person awake and alert, that is a big part of what we're looking for. The spectrum of alertness goes all the way from comatose and, and completely unresponsive to awake and answering all your questions and everything in between. So some simple ways to think of this is literally, are their eyes open? Are they responding to you? And then are they following commands? One important thing that falls under mental status is speech. And so it's very important to understand, is someone speaking and responding to you normally? And if not, is that because they aren't awake at all or because they are awake, but they're not able to speak to you? That can be a little bit tough to uh, determine when you're on the scene, especially if a family member is busy giving you history. But if you can, directly speaking to the patient, even if they appear to be near comatose can be really helpful to try to make this determination for yourself. The next step in the stroke evaluation is 
cranial nerves. And we're not going to go into every cranial nerve. I know that uh, may give some of you PTSD. Um, we're going to talk about just a few that are really important and easy to evaluate when it comes to stroke. So the cranial nerves that one has to do with smell, we never ever test that, especially in an urgent setting. And uh, that's reserved for, you know, office visits. Um, two, looking at visual acuity and visual field. So this is thinking about uh, your optic nerve. And so what do we mean by visual acuity? That's your 2020, your 2015. But that doesn't cover everything, uh, whether they wear glasses or not. When we think of visual fields, this is what we're thinking of. It's very common for people to come in and say, I lost vision in my right eye, but patients often can't tell us whether they've lost vision in just the right eye or if they've lost vision in a right field, which would be depicted kind of like this. Um, these circles represent each eye. And so the difference between losing vision in a monocular fashion or one eye and losing vision in a field or what that means is both eyes are affected and you can't see that part of the world. For us, that really screams eye problem versus brain problem. Having problems in the visual cortex is going to impact both eyes and that's a really important takeaway. So how do you tell the difference between these? thinking about closing one eye and opening the other, this person would have perfect vision in their good eye. And then when they open the bad eye and try to look just through that eye, they would have blurry vision or no vision at all. This person, no matter which eye is open, is gonna have difficulty seeing on that affected side. So the next set of cranial nerves all lumped together here, three, four, and six, have to do with eye movements. This is a big part of the NIH stroke scale and also really important to understand. So what are we looking for when it comes to eye movements? Do the eyes at baseline rest in the middle? And is someone able to go all the way to one side and all the way to the other side? I think the way to determine if this is normal or abnormal, some people start out with their eyes looking like this, that is abnormal. And some people are not able to get their eyes all the way to the side, that is also abnormal. So this is really the basic examination that we're thinking of because we know when one side of the brain is injured, you are gonna have issues getting your eyes all the way to one side or all the way to the other. Now, there are syndromes that have to do with the back of the brain where just one eye can be affected. That can be a little difficult to determine, but for the purposes of this talk, what I really want you to take away is that having any problem with your eyes moving together all the way to one side or the other is a reason to consider that a stroke may be happening. Facial sensation. This is something patients will often complain about. And one thing that I was speaking to a patient about this week, we think of negative symptoms being concerning for stroke rather than positive. And all that means is that numbness or a lack of sensation is very concerning to us, whereas tangling or extra sensation, we consider a positive phenomenon that's actually a little bit less concerning and can be a bit reassuring to us. Patients won't distinguish oftentimes. They may say numbness and tingling is what they're having, but if you can get them to spell out the difference, that can actually be really helpful. Facial muscles. So this is a great part of the exam because nearly everyone can do it. And part of our educating the community has to do with recognizing a facial droop. So the fun thing here is trying to figure out which side actually has the facial droop. And so this is a, a doctor who all became a patient and took pictures of himself and published it. Um, and what I want you to take away here is if you look at this first picture, you actually are able to see some signs of 
him having facial weakness on his right side. And so when he smiles, that's an easy way to see that he's able to activate this side of his face, but not this side as well. But if we go back to his face at baseline, I think we can see that there are not as many creases on this side. It looks a little relaxed in this area compared to this side. Now, that's really subtle. And the only reason I point it out is because sometimes people are able to activate their face normally and smile and show you their teeth. But when they are at rest, they may have an asymmetric face. So knowing that there are signs that you can see even when they are not smiling can be helpful. Next, hearing. A lot of our patients are elderly in Lancaster, and so a lot of people may come in hard of hearing. Understanding if they are at baseline is basically all you need to assess on this point. And thinking about these final reflexes, I really can't emphasize enough that thinking about the gag and the tongue are really super important to us, and they are really under-tested. And that's because there's not a really great way to test in the field. What I can say is that thinking about your gag reflex or your tongue muscles, your ability to swallow, these things are impacted in posterior circulation strokes, which are the hardest to detect. And they can be, indicate, indicators can be difficulty with swallowing secretions, someone who is seems to be coughing or gagging, or even severe nausea can kind of fall into this family. So I'm not going to go through the paths these cranial nerves take. I think the most important thing to take away is that these are derived from nerves in the back of the brain. They're affected by posterior circulation and they can often be overlooked. Okay, so I wanted to now return to the MRI score, which I know is often used uh, to evaluate people in the field before bringing them in and to determine if a large stroke is likely to happen. So knowing what we know now, I think it's very easy to look at this and determine which part of the brain is actually being assessed. So when we think about speech, we talked about that's coming from the front of the brain. A, face, a facial droop, if we think about that being facial muscles, also the front of the brain. If we think about your arm and leg strength, front of the brain eye movements. So this is one place that is picking up something that could be coming from the front of the brain or the back of the brain. So it, like I said, eyes are really important. And so when we think of gaze deviation, meaning your eyes being fixed to one side and not moving to the other side, that can be a sign of obviously something is wrong, but it could be coming from either part of the brain. Aphasia, we talked about this also goes with speech. And so I want to take a moment to say up here when you're asking the patient to repeat a phrase, is it normal or abnormal? There are a lot of ways that these can give you abnormal points, right? So either they are not able to follow your instructions to repeat, they're not able to get words out, or if their words are slurred. All of those would give you abnormal speech but only one of those things would be coming from the back of the brain. Slurred speech is totally different than not being able to follow a command or not being able to get words out. So understanding that you can assess both of those things with this one point can be super helpful and points to a different part of the brain. So here, they're really testing to see if they can understand your command. Uh, close your eyes. I would offer to say, make sure when they close their eyes, they open their eyes for you as well, because this could be marked as correct if they blink normally. So it's not a great command, but it is a simple one. And make a fist. Uh, that is a good command, but in other languages, it's not um, the same uh, meaning necessarily. It can be a, a little bit more of a complicated command. Uh, and you have to have strength in order to make a fist, right? So if they understand you, but they're not able to make a fist, that's also something to keep in mind here. Lastly, does the, per does the person recognize their deficit? This is actually a high level difficult thing to assess. So asking the patient, whose arm is this? 
it's trying to assess if there is neglect, which can point to a large right-sided stroke. But in order to respond to this question, they have to be awake. They have to be able to tell you words and respond to this appropriately. So you can see that if someone has aphasia, they may also get points for this as well. So these, these tests aren't perfect, but if they are abnormal, at least that tells you something is probably abnormal. And I want you to take away that these are mostly looking at the front of the brain. Okay, so I wanna go through a couple of cases here to illustrate the different types of strokes that could come in because all different types of strokes could give you similar symptoms uh, with a few distinct differences, um, but a lot of them will give you the same symptoms just based on where the stroke is occurring. So case one, this is a really dramatic case, a young man who had a history of a clotting issue. He had um, a stroke in his spleen basically in the past and he was on blood thinners at one point. He stopped his blood thinners with his doctor's instructions and was going about his life. And later um, on the day he came to us, he was witnessed to slump over to the side. He was awake, but not speaking when the ambulance arrived. He came to the hospital and because he's young and strokes are uncommon in young people, but it's important to know that they do occur. His weakness was noticed several hours later when he was silent and lethargic, the primary thought was this was likely to be some sort of intoxication. And the treatment for that is often just to wait. But that unfortunately is the opposite of what you wanna do for a person having a stroke. So this is really important to keep in mind that you can assess weakness even in people who don't follow your instructions. You'll often see us hold people's arms up for them or we may give them a little pinch to see if they move um, the same on both sides. The other thing I wanna harp on here is that being able to move both sides does not mean that you move both sides equally. So what we're really looking for here is a difference in strength. So it doesn't have to be totally gone, but if one side is weaker than the other, then we would be concerned. And so this gentleman, was found to have a very large stroke. And based on that picture that we went over looking at the areas of the brain, we can see that this is really impacting what we would call that almost the entire anterior circulation. This is an MCA stroke. Um, he did not initially have an ACA, which is midline and in the front and he did not have PCA, which is kind of midline in the back. Um, but this is all due to one blood vessel, and he lo looked really ill, and he was obviously dramatically impacted by this. Um, just for orientation purposes, this is the back of his head, and this is the front, and then radiology and neurology is reversed. So this is his left side, as if his feet are coming out at us, and so his left side was impacted and so he was weak on his right and he had aphasia which is why he was mute and not able to follow commands okay so that was a stroke due to a clot which is by far the most common type of stroke it covers roughly 80 to 85 percent of all strokes and that's why all of the scoring systems focus so much on recognizing those strokes because we have a treatment for those. Um, we have the thrombolytic at our hospital. We use tenecteplase. Other hospitals use TPA. Uh, they're both studied and uh, shown to provide better outcomes if they're given within the first couple of hours. So as we talked about, understanding how someone started their baseline and understanding exactly when these symptoms started is the most important thing. So that gentleman had a witnessed event. So it actually would have been very clear um, coming in if we had thought, if it was thought from the beginning that he was having a stroke. Uh, so this is a similar case. A woman comes in, she was able to report her own history. So that was very helpful for her. She was in her 60s and had a prior stroke. Interestingly, her prior stroke had um, 
impacted her vision. So she was aware that this could be a problem. And she came in with partial vision loss. Her story was very clear. She was reading her phone when she lost vision on just part of her phone. So she said she was looking straight at it and she just couldn't see half of her phone all of a sudden. And so she knew that could be a problem. Now, going through the scoring systems, her stroke scale was actually incredibly low. She did not have weakness. She was able to speak normally. Um, but as I mentioned, strokes that happen in the back of the brain and on the bottom of the brain can be really underrated. And so this is a stroke that happened on her right temporal lobe. This is a posterior circulation stroke, and it's actually taking up a lot of her brain, right? So this is a case that we have talked about in our group and with our providers to remind everyone that just because you have a low stroke score does not mean you have a small stroke. Small strokes can give you a big number and even some big strokes can give you a small number. So the most important thing is to consider, do you think a stroke is happening? Not to necessarily decide if it's definitely big or small, because we can all be wrong about that. So she came in and was able to get treated uh, with our thrombolytic. And even though she had this large area of injury, research has shown that people who get thrombolytics quickly have better outcomes. So she actually was one of those people who had a really good outcome and a significant return of her vision, even though she had a lot of demonstrated injury to her brain when we looked at her MRI. So this was a really good outcome and a really helpful case to learn from for lots of people. So this next woman, um, very interesting story uh, because she had a strong family history of brain bleeds. So we talked about clots being the most common source of strokes or blocked arteries being the most common source. But then the other category of strokes is hemorrhagic strokes or strokes from bleeds. And so that can be further subdivided into bleeds that happen in the brain tissue and bleeds that happen in the space around brain tissue. And so the difference there is an intracerebral hemorrhage or intraparenchymal hemorrhage, which is the brain bleed happening in the tissue. And the other type of bleed is the subarachnoid bleed, which the biggest concern there is that if it is due to an aneurysm, which we looked at pictures of those, it has to be treated immediately. And if it is untreated or if it continues to bleed, can lead to death in a significant number of people. So recognizing these is really important. This woman was in her 70s and had been having headaches. So she had an MR that showed an aneurysm. So she was aware that she had an aneurysm and she had a family history of aneurysm as well. And she came in with a severe headache. She was altered. She also had nausea and she had weakness. Now, she was able to tell us later about the headache, but she was so sick and vomiting on arrival that she couldn't really tell us that she was experiencing significant headache when she arrived. So her primary um, issue in the EMS notes was nausea and weakness on one side. So one thing I wanted to harp on here is that nausea can be a really good warning sign along with headache for bleeds in the brain. And that's exactly what she had here. So she had a subarachnoid bleed that came from her aneurysm affecting her ACA artery, which is in the front, what we just talked about. And um, this bright area here should not be there. That's where her blood was layering. And so we knew about her aneurysm, so we were able to target it and treat it quickly. And she gave me permission to use this photo. She spent, you know, uh, several, several days um, over a week in the hospital with us and uh, was able to have a great outcome and return to her prior state of health. Uh, so the next case I want to talk about, um, similarly, uh, someone who came in with um, a history of high blood pressure and kidney disease and also came in with left-sided weakness. When we got our rapid imaging, which involves getting a CAT scan and also getting perfusion, 
this um, is what we saw. And so a lot of our EMS partners hang out with us in the scanner. And so if you do that, you'll see some of these pictures. And what we do is not rocket science. So we make bright colors and we compare them. And that's how we determine if there is a problem. So here on the left, this is supposed to be a graph of flow to the brain. And where there is bright color, there is an issue with flow to the brain. On the left, what we are looking at is timing for blood to be delivered to the brain. And so any place where there is a delay in blood flow, it's highlighted in green. And so we think of this as the area of the brain that's likely to already have a stroke versus the area that's at risk of having a stroke if we don't intervene. So this is a person who came in early and was a prime candidate to get a thrombectomy. And so this person scored very high on the stroke scales and had weakness on their left side. Um, I think they also had neglect and other issues that would have shown up on that stroke scale. And so what we can see here is this is a picture that looks similar to that blood vessel arrangement that we looked at. So we have the posterior circulation vessels that are present and we have the anterior circulation vessels that are present and we like symmetry. So we look at this on the patient's left side and we see all these blood vessels coming out this way. And we look at the right side where there is an issue with flow and we notice that there is a sharp cutoff in this blood vessel. So this person went to go get a thrombectomy, which we take patients if they're, we find one of those big cutoffs. And this is a really nice image of contrast being delivered into the brain and the contrast just abruptly stops here. And so this is, you can actually see the bones surrounding the eye sockets. So this person is looking directly at us and this is their right side being injected with contrast. And this artery simply does not continue beyond this point. So this is what we call a large vessel occlusion. Uh, it is one of the closer blood vessels who are able to reach it with the catheter. And after the procedure, you can see that same blood vessel is now open and you have contrast in blood being delivered to this whole part of the brain, which was previously not getting blood flow. So this is a really nice um, kind of pass through of what we see from the field to someone coming in and having urgent imaging that doesn't um, show flow being delivered. And then once we get in, this is able to be seen live, uh, almost like a movie. I didn't do that for this PowerPoint, just so PowerPoint would open and not crash during our presentation, but we're able to see that it would um, match that area that had poor flow to begin with. After the procedure, this person had strokes that were very small. And so if you remember that pink area that had evidence of maybe some stroke that already occurred, these little dots match where that pink area was on those initial images, but all of that green area is spared, was saved by the procedure. So this is a great outcome. These tiny little strokes is something this person easily recovered from and um, something that we want people to know we can do for them with a thrombectomy. So we spend a lot of time talking to our patients about the reason to come in quickly is that if we're able to pull out the clot causing the stroke, then we can have a really uh, nice outcome for the brain with minimal damage to tissue. Okay, so another case here. Uh, this was a gentleman who was in his 50s. He came in with no medical history uh, and he had unilateral weakness. He had weakness on his right side and speech changes. And so now we know from everything we've discussed that speech is often impacted by damage to the left side of the brain. And that matches with the right side of his body being weak because the left side of the brain also controls the right side of the body in terms of strength. So both of these things match with the left side and the front of the brain being impacted but it's not clear what the source is yet. And so when we got a CAT scan for this, this gentleman, when he came in, what we see is something different. So instead of seeing um, those bright colors that we use to find uh, clots that are blocking flow, this is the initial CAT scan that shows 
you know, this rim of bone and then inside we have the brain and it's reversed just like all of our other images. So this is his right side and this is his left side. And we have this bright spot here, this hyperdensity that represents acute bleeding in the brain. And this matches very well with a location commonly affected by high blood pressure. So when we see this, this matches with what he came in with. And it also impacts all of the fibers coming down through this part of the brain. It's a very high traffic area for the fibers that control muscle strength. So everything matched up here. The speech center is up here. The motor fibers are going through this part of the brain. So all of that would be impacted by this bleeding. Okay, so now a good time for review. Um, what we have here is anatomy of the brain that hopefully we could take away that different parts of the brain supplied by different arteries show up differently on these scoring systems. So which types of stroke are most common? Your options here are ischemic strokes or strokes caused by clots, hemorrhagic strokes, which include intracerebral hemorrhages, and subarachnoid hemorrhages. So if you're not sure, you can rewind just a few minutes and uh, find the answer, but hopefully you remember from the cases we went through and uh, some of the things we just talked about. What type of stroke is picked up by the MRACE and the NIH stroke scale? So what I want you to consider here is not a particular artery, but your options are really anterior pro anterior circulation or posterior circulation. Those are the two broad categories of strokes that are assessed by these scoring systems. So based on everything we've gone over, which one of these is best represented by these scoring systems? And lastly, what's the most important thing to find out about a patient when you first meet them? So we talked about this a couple of times, uh, and if you're not sure, just rewind a few minutes and hopefully you'll be able to find that answer. Okay, so normally I would be there in person with you to answer questions in real time, uh, but thank you for watching this video and I hope that you learned something from this. Our goal at LGH is really to make sure that everyone knows that time is brain and the faster you get them into any hospital that is able to perform the uh, thrombolytic therapy and if possible uh, thrombectomy, the better the outcomes for the patient. So we're very proud to be performing both of those interventions and we are looking forward to treating even more patients in the future as we rely on research to tell us who else can be treated. So right now we're able to treat people within four and a half hours of their symptom onset, their last known well, uh, but we have been reviewing research to try to expand that patient population and we're really excited about that. We've been doing thrombectomy since 2018 and we look forward to trying to expand that patient population as well. So the ideal people for that procedure are the people who you meet in the fields that have a very high stroke scale and they hopefully just had their symptom onset. But we consider doing the procedure in anyone who's had symptoms in the last 24 hours. So it's really a broad window. We cast a wide net and we like to consider everyone and we'll obtain that imaging the perfusion images to compare brain that's already injured to brain that's at risk. And if we think there's brain to save there, there's a good chance that we'll try to do that procedure and see if we can improve their outcomes. Uh, one of the final questions I often get is about age. And I think uh, some of our, our partners are often surprised that we love doing procedures for our very elderly patients. Now, those are people who are often over 90 years old in Lancaster. We have a lot of long-lived citizens and they may also come with a, um, a DNR or a DNI and, and advanced directive and very specific wishes. 
So it's really important to take away that if you detect a stroke in an elderly person, we do not discriminate based on age. We actually think quite the opposite. It's often the case that this procedure for a stroke could be the difference between life and death for them. At 30 years old, like one of our, our cases, people can tolerate quite a lot of injury and still survive and go on to have quite a surprising amount of improvement. Once you bring elderly patients with past medical history that is significant and um, their baseline is not perfect, having a stroke can be the difference between life and death. So oftentimes there's a delay in bringing grandma or grandpa to the hospital because you're not sure there would be anything to do. But those are often the people where we are the most aggressive because we know that without the procedure, they may go on to pass away from this in addition to their other illness, but we have lots of great outcomes in our elderly folks as well. So we don't discriminate against them. We encourage everyone to look for the signs of stroke. And if you see them uh, and your scores are high on these um, scoring systems in the field, pre-alert them. We'll be there waiting for you and we'll try to get them treated. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you for having me and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Feel free to contact me at danielle.cross at penmedicine.upenn.edu. I'd be happy to answer any other questions or join you for a different lecture.